agree or disagree with the following DFS or sportsbook plays for tonight's seven-game NBA slate. So Nikola Jokic, once again, the most expensive player on the slate at 12500 but he's a little banged up, right? The big mm. man is dealing with right toe soreness. I always, I'm sorry, toe soreness. Yeah. It just always, I know it's real. You ever, have you ever stubbed your toe? Have you ever had turf I, toe? I like understand it's legit. that like it's I could legit, barely walk, but, but it I just always makes me laugh when I have to say that. Toe soreness, and it's questionable tonight against Minnesota. So, Chaser Fade, you should be staying away from the reigning MVP tonight, even if he suits up because of toe Toast soreness. Toe. Garion? Uh, fade that you should stay away from him. Chase that Nikola Jokic being out due to toe soreness would be hilarious, considering <laughs> all we've had to find out about Nikola Jokic and his family and his upbringing uh, since the Morris twin episode. Um, look, I, I think we start most of these slates with a couple questions. Question one, is Denver playing? If the answer to that is yes. Question two, is Nikola Jokic breathing? And if the answer to that question is also yes, you have to consider Nikola Jokic viable. I mean, you go back to January 15th. I know I keep saying numbers like this, but they keep getting better. 1.87 DraftKings points per minute played. We just saw this guy post over 60 DraftKings points in less than 29 minutes the last time the Nuggets took the court. If he's active tonight, and thankfully this isn't like the latest game on the slate, we'll probably find out the status of Jokic well before tip-off for the 7 p.m. games. You just have to play him because the other factor here is Minnesota might be the best possible matchup someone like Jokic could draw. Not only are they a terrible defensive team, 24th in defensive rating for the season, they are second in pace across their last 10 games. You're just giving Jokic more possessions to be the most efficient player in the NBA. So that level of efficiency, that level of volume, you just can't ignore it. Nick, uh, yeah. you agree he's breathing, his toes attached to his body, you gotta consider him? I mean, I'm, there are some sites where even if he's not breathing, I would consider <laughs> throwing him out there. I, I mean, luckily we do have seven games on the slate tonight, which is a little bigger than most Tuesday slates. So if you don't want to go with Jokic, I mean, you have plenty of other options. You have Giannis, you have Towns, you have Vucevic, even Siakam, Balanchunas, Adebayo. All those guys are above 8K at center. So, you know, if the toe situation scares you off, I, I don't know what happened there. Maybe he did stub it. Maybe like a horse stepped on it or something. I have no idea. Uh, but chances <laughs> are, like Gary implied, Jokic is going to play through this. I mean, he's, for a guy who's had so many questions about like his body over the years, like that's completely faded away. I mean, he's, it, for, for DFS, we don't really talk about, you know, how much it, it means to be an Ironman, but I, I think that's the most underrated thing about Jokic you know, in his rise as a superstar is he misses fewer games than just about anybody. I mean, it's, it's absolutely crazy. And, you know, a lot of guys, when you have like a ticky-tack injury like this, if it's Embiid or, you know, even Giannis has kind of gotten to this point, you're like, eh, I don't know if he's going to play. You know, we see questionable with Jokic and it essentially just means nothing. You know, he's probably going to play through this. And if he does, I'm with Gary. And I, I mean, you, you really, I don't know what his price would have to be at this point where it would, it would get to the point where you'd say, no, I'm 100% sure it's not worth it with him. Look at this. A brontosaurus, because it's large and it has a toe as a head, just like Nikola Jokic. Um, all right. We're talking about LeBron James. It, yeah, I think that. Yeah. Uh, anywho. Thanks for uh, adding that. Who is a totally awesome value player you're chasing tonight, <laughs> Nick? Uh, I have a few that I'll toss out. I think Jackson Hayes, who actually looked really good last night for New Orleans, started alongside Balanchunas. I don't think that they start together again. I think that was more to combat the Evan Mobley, Jared Allen front line in Cleveland. Uh, but Hayes looked really good. He, he, he's at 3,700 tonight. Uh, it's possible that Balanchunas could be held out on the second half of a back-to-back. -back. He just came back from an illness. Um, so keep an eye on that lineup. If they start together, I like Hayes. If Balanchunas is out, I like Hayes. If not, uh, probably stay away from him. I think Jordan McLaughlin at 3,500. Uh, if D'Angelo Russell and or Patrick Beverly sit out again for Minnesota, he kind of usurped the Jalen Noel role in the last game, had 28 DraftKings points in that one. Uh, Corey Kispert at 3,300 with no Brad Beal uh, could be interesting. And then Chuma Okiki, who I think continues to be really undervalued. He's down at 4,500. Not a great matchup against Chicago, but he has 32 plus DraftKings points in three of his last four. And he's one of those guys that, you know, sometimes he'll only have like seven or eight points, but then you look up and he has 35 DraftKings points because he has three steals, three blocks, four assists. Uh, kind of does it all for Orlando. All right, talk to me, Garyan. Need a value play from you, dude. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of viable guys in that, like, mid-tier range who we can say definitively right now will be good value plays. Like, I think Spencer Dinwiddie under 6K is fantastic. Uh, Gary Trent Jr. has got four consecutive 30-point games. Um, but when you're starting to look at the cheaper options, you're just going to have to play a little bit of a waiting game. I think of the guys below 4K, I'm pretty confident in James Johnson at this point at 3,900, especially with no LaMarcus Aldridge tonight for the Nets. Obviously, I think Johnson's value is improved if there's no Harden. You know, just not having to play next to two usage monsters would be beneficial. But someone's going to need to play a bunch of minutes on the interior for the Nets, and they're going to need Johnson's size and his strength. And it's not like we're working from a base of nothing here. He's averaged 29 and a half minutes per game across their last three contests. So if James Johnson is even getting close to 30 minutes or cresting 30 minutes on any given slate. I think you have to give him a serious look. And then the Warriors. I mean, what's going to happen with Steph Curry? It's kind of one of the big questions for this slate. It looms large. And we saw someone like Moses Moody, who is the absolute minimum, get a spot start in last night's contest. Would that happen again if Curry's not playing? I don't know. But obviously, Golden State is going to be a place where you could mine a ton of value depending on how they decide to roll out their rotation on the second night of the back-to-back. Yeah, Gary, and uh, let's talk about that. So Spurs hosting the Warriors tonight. Uh, they're going to be without Clay Thompson, who's going to rest on the second night of a back-to-back. And like you mentioned, some speculation Steph Curry could also sit out after playing big minutes Monday against Houston. Spurs are plus 110 on the money line at home tonight. So Gary, and Chaser Fate and Antonio pulls off the victory. I mean, it really just comes down to Curry, honestly. Um, I I will say we have spent a lot of time the last couple of weeks talking about how Golden State's numbers are just not that great when Draymond Green is not playing. So, you know, we don't have any question marks about that. Green will not be taking the court tonight. So I guess you could look at this and say, hey, San Antonio, home dog. Even if Curry's playing, he played big minutes last night. Maybe we don't get the full version of Steph Curry. Maybe taking them as underdog is a half decent idea i just worry that really the spurs haven't had too many amazing victories yes their their defeat of the bulls was nice but when you look at their last like 15 games their point differential is really hanging by the fact that they just crushed oklahoma city they've like had some big wins against terrible teams and they've struggled against good teams they're actually two and six ats they're past eight against teams above 500 and just one in six ATS their last seven games as an underdog. So they just don't really beat good teams. So unless we hear definitively that Curry's out and you have an opportunity to jump on this quickly, I don't think I'm really looking to back the Spurs tonight. Well, Nick, you're not going to get plus 110 if Curry is ruled out. So what do we think? Well, I, I, I don't know what to think about Curry. I mean, the, the line moved up to Warriors minus two um, from, from Warriors minus one earlier today. So maybe, you know, those Curry concerns have been quelled to some degree. But, of course, no Clay Thompson either way tonight. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if they held Curry out. So we're, we're kind of in wait-and-see mode here. Uh, but like Gary had said, I mean, you know, San Antonio, 500 against the spread at home. Golden State, 500 against the spread on the road this season. So there's not a lot of data there. But... You know, it, it is tough to trust the Spurs team. I mean, they, it feels like they're a cut above, like, the truly bad teams in the Western Conference, and they are, but they, they don't have a ton of great wins to hang their hat on, and, and Gold State does. But, you know, watching Gold State recently, they squeaked out some impressive wins, you know, in games where Curry hasn't played all that well. Uh, but the way that they're currently playing and the way they're currently constructed with Draymond Green out, I don't necessarily trust this team uh, against a competent team like the Spurs. That doesn't have a great record, but... Still has a pretty nice roster. I think DeJounte Murray on Stephen Curry, if he plays, is an interesting positional matchup. Uh, and the Spurs also rested several of their veterans, Pirtle, uh, Derek White, Murray, over the weekend. So all those guys are back healthy. They're back fresh tonight. Meanwhile, Warriors come in on the second half of a back-to-back. Yeah, they beat Houston last night. Yeah, Curry you know, kind of snapped out of that slump. But, I mean, that game was probably a little bit closer than it should have been. And, and honestly, we've seen enough of a sample from Curry that – you know, he's been, he's been legitimately bad in like 75 to 80 percent, you know, of their last 30 games or so. I'm not quite ready to say he's back just because he had a good game against Kevin Porter Jr. Well, Nick, the Bucks are the biggest favorites on the board. They're favored by 11 at home over the Wizards, who have lost five in a row. So Milwaukee, only 10 and 17 against the spread at home this season. So chase or fade that they cover tonight. I don't know what to think about the Bucks anymore. They're, they're just 8 and 15 against the spread as a home favorite this season. They actually lost to this Wizards team by seven 
uh, back in November. Very different circumstances. Uh, Drew Holiday was not available for that game. The Wizards were like the best team in the East at that time. Uh, and obviously things have come crashing down for them. Um, you know, it, it, it's tough. I mean, Milwaukee is not used to getting blown out by Cleveland and Denver like they were last week. Those were shocking losses for a team that had, you know, all three of Giannis, Middleton, and Holiday available for those games. So, you know, it's kind of forced me to reevaluate how I think about Milwaukee. But at the same time, this is a Wizards team that is struggling. It's a Wizards team that will not have Brad Beal for this game. Um, you know, you read reports that this team is not getting along well. Spencer Dinwiddie said he tried to be a leader and was basically told, no, thank you. Uh, we, we, we don't respect you as a leader. Um, you know, for, things aren't really great in Milwaukee right now, but I think they're even worse in Washington, D.C. So, you know, 11 points is a lot, uh, especially for a team that just hasn't been that good at home this season. But I, I think at the end of the day, you have to look at the talent. And, and without Brad Beal, uh, I'm going to back Milwaukee tonight. Yeah, Gary, and I don't expect things to get better without Beal on the floor. I will say this, though. Wizards 6-3 and three overall without him in the lineup this year, in the nine games that he's missed. Yeah, they're actually uh, better offensively when Brad Beal isn't on the court this season. And we're getting to a relatively large sample size. Um, they are 3.2 points per 100 possessions better when Beal has not been on the floor in 2021-2022. So I'm not saying they're going to win this game. I mean, maybe we've gotten to a point with Milwaukee where after what felt like a half decade of, oh, they're a great regular season team, but can they do it in the playoffs? You know, maybe they've decided to take the tried and true. We know what we are in the playoffs. We're going to coast a little bit during the regular season. Like, this has also been the strangest three-year stretch of NBA history. So who really knows what their strategy has been in terms of just sheer effort so far in the regular season. Um, but they probably don't care that much about this early February matchup with a really bad Wizards team. I'm not saying I feel strongly about it. It would be a slight lean, but... They're two and nine ATS, the Bucks. Their last 11 games as a favorite. Like I said, Washington's been all right without Brad Beal. I'll take the points here, but it's not one of my favorite bets tonight.